too much me, um, <laughs> is to, uh, what were we talking about here? Yes, I love Matt, he loves me, that's what we're talking about. Um, <laughs> And the chance that this creates, though, and the question that I have for you is how can we manageably and usefully use computational social science methods to allow us to understand and answer this question? This, I would put to you, is one of the central questions of our time. Uh, not to put too fine a point on it, but um, as we get into the minutia, I want to make sure that we at least have from 10,000 feet sort of realize that what we're doing here is to, is to have a conversation about not what are the failings of our democracy, but what can we do to fix them, and what can we do empirically to actually understand and know what works. So I won't uh, belabor this point more than I have already to say that what's underlying this is an argument that collective intelligence, that groups of people coming together using new machines can actually enable institutions to work better and smarter. Uh, you're, of course, all familiar with Duolingo from having attempted to learn Klingon, I'm sure, or maybe started and failed to learn Spanish, uh, like me. Um, but you know that Louis von Ahn's work using Duolingo, like so many other experiments in the collective intelligence space, uses what we know in terms of the data and learnings from how people learned. You look at an adjective before you look at a verb um, to redesign and improve the system. We need to do more of the, what we've done for learning languages. We need to do that for democracy to see if we can't create a systematic conversation to tap into people's collective intelligence. So there's a kind of gating assumption here, which I recognize that not everybody shares, that people are smart, that we will contribute productively, uh, that they have skills to share, but that we lack the mechanisms at the moment to connect that collective intelligence to political decision making. That's where the concept of crowd law comes in. It's a, just a term that we gave to this idea of crowds of people coming together on the internet to engage in lawmaking practices. There are subsets of this, like crowd constitution making that they've done in Iceland, or crowd regulation, or crowd adjudication. But we're seeing uses of collective intelligence uh, uh, using new technology, enabled by new technology, to change now how lawmaking bodies work. We have developed, but not yet launched or talked about a project called Crowd Law for Congress, which you can find at congress.crowd.law, to begin to talk about what's going on in the rest of the world. Uh, I'm going to only mention a couple of those examples today, because what I want to do is focus our time in talking about experiments. Um, but there's lots of stuff up there. We have over 100 uh, examples cataloged at catalog.crowd.law and on congress.crowd.law we have short videos and exemplars of how parliaments around the world are beginning to use new technology to engage with members of the public. Incidentally, just footnote, all of these are ripe for experimentation, for research, for writing about. There's very, very, very little work being done in this space at the moment. And there's a lot of data being put out by these systems because they're all being done online. So just a footnote to this, forget about everything I'm saying. There's just a lot of stuff up there that's worth actually looking at. Again, I won't belabor the details of what I would normally talk about, which is how these platforms are used at different stages of the lawmaking process and how they're designed to do different things at different points in the process. I'm going to just mention today one or two examples to further illustrate what I'm talking about. Focus on the stage of the lawmaking process in which laws actually get drafted. So the point at which the law actually gets written um, one example, now some one of the earliest examples of this, do we have any Brazilians in the room? So do you remember the Marco Civil? Did you participate? Uh, at the risk, I'm not allowed, am I allowed to ask him to say something or then nobody can hear? I have to repeat it. All right, so very briefly, sorry, I'm just checking out the logistics here. Tell people what that was.
So the, just, to sum, just to summarize, the Marcus Veal was, was a regulatory process to enact a law to regulate the Internet, and that process is one of the earliest examples of using the Internet to reach out to citizens to get their opinions, to get their input before drafting that law. Now, this last year, uh, the same group that developed that project, ITS Rio, uh, at the law school there, have created a new app called Mudamos, which in its first year has seen 750,000 people sign up to write proposals for the legislature. So citizens can draft proposals, which if they reach an adequate threshold, can be considered by the legislature for enactment. What's quite interesting about this project is that in addition to the 750,000 people signed up online, they have, they have a team of crowdsourced lawyers and experts who then help to refine those proposals into something that's legally valid and correct and usable. Um, it's still very much in its infancy in terms of impact, but you can see definitely something about the, I think, thirst and hunger for engagement when you get 750,000 people signing up in just a few months of the creation of such a thing. In Mexico City, I know Karina is from Mexico here. Where are you from? Baja, somewhere here in the room. There you are. Uh, we may have some other Mexicans uh, here as well listening online. But in Mexico City, they wanted to enact a new constitution about 2016. Uh, and so what they did was they set up a multi-stage process that involved the mayor decided that instead of trying to top-down promulgate the Constitution, they would actually engage people online in making, uh, writing drafts of uh, elements of the Constitution, provisions of the Constitution. Again, if they got enough signatures, those people would then get uh, to meet the Constitutional Drafting Committee, they would get to meet the mayor, and they would have their proposals considered. Um, this was considered a dramatically successful project um, because of the number of citizen-drafted proposals that actually found their way into the final draft of the Constitution. Okay, so just two quick examples. Again, you'll find lots more at crowd.law if you're interested in these projects and platforms, and I'm happy to point you to more examples of of these kinds of projects that have lots of data back of them. Next, I want to tell you a little bit about some experiments that we designed uh, and are in part starting to run and then shift to talking about some new experiments. So there's another platform that's been developed called the Decide platform that is actually the brand name in Madrid of a platform, the generic name of which is Consul. Is anybody from Spain here? No Spaniards in the room. Okay, you will also find this project, though, in Uruguay by a different name, in Barcelona by a different name. There are about 100 cities using this platform, which automatically, by the way, should be sending off bells to you going, wow, 100 cities using the same platform for democratic engagement. That is a boatload of data, and it is. And in Madrid by itself, they have 460,000 people who are signed up to use this platform which in part enables what we might call participatory budgeting, citizens spending money, uh, deciding how to spend money on behalf of the city council. It also has a feature called propuestas, uh, uh, called propuestas, which are proposals where citizens, like in the Brazilian context, can make proposals to the legislature, which if they get 1% of the population of Madrid to sign them, that's the legal threshold, they will move forward for consideration by the legislature. But here's the challenge. You have 460,000 signed up, but how many of, how many citizens, and 20,000 citizen proposals that have been made, how many of those have been enacted as law? You got it, the big fat zero. So it gives rise to the interesting question of why are the proposals getting so few signatures. Now, if you were to look at this simply from a design perspective, if you were to go and look at the website right now, you would immediately say, oh, I know why they're getting so few proposals. I could design this website better. I would do this, I would do that, I would do the other thing. But it presents a really interesting opportunity for research, something I've written about, 
uh, uh, to experiment, especially when you have 460,000 people online. And you've surely talked before and everybody's read bit by bit and the whole group is full of people who are thinking about how do we do these kinds of randomized control trials using available data sources like these. Citizen engagement is really the next frontier of new available data sources because there is so much data emerging on these platforms, none of which existed before a few years ago. So the question is, obviously we can do lots of natural experiments of just looking at how people behave online and looking at how they sign up and looking at what they do, but you will know better than I all the kinds of things that you can do using the data that's available from this site. So I'm going to go quick through this very quickly just because I want to get to the discussion about the new experiments and have as much of a conversation about this as possible. Um, I should say from the outset, though, as much as I'm making this sound easy, uh, like, oh, lots of data, a source of experiments, it is not simple to do this kind of research in the wild. It is not simple to get a government entity or even a civil society organization that's made a process for engagement and get them to tweak the features to allow you to run experiments with, with it. It's not so simple as all that, else it would have all been done already. So it's not an easy process, but I think there's a very compelling argument to make, especially as the world worries more and more about the future of democracy, especially as we have more of these projects, but they're kind of halfway successful. Uh, there's a real, I think, be er early stages of hunger and thirst for researchers to get interested in and to play a role in a space they haven't typically been involved. And again, let me say that that is not simply because of resistance on the part of government or bureaucracy or challenges from uh, institutions in that sense. Just as much of the resistance comes from the world of activists, of civic technologists, of the people who often are the creators of these platforms, who feel passionate as activists about citizen engagement, who have very strong views about what kind of democracy they want to see happen on these sites, and are equally often resistant to the possibilities of change uh, and of measurement. Uh, so just to be clear that this is not a challenge, it's not, I don't want to, as somebody who currently is in government, I surely don't want to, uh, uh, what shall we say, harsh on government uh, exclusively. There are a lot of challenges to having these conversations about introducing research, and I would say the challenge comes probably more from the .org side than from the .gov side, uh, in my view. But, uh, and, and, that's, and that is again because there is a very kind of contested notion of what is the democracy that we want to foster. So if you were to say, which I have to these guys in Madrid, why do you have a petition system in the first place? They have a very strong view, the people who built it have said, we want to be like Switzerland. Like Spain is not like Switzerland, that much I know. And I'm not sure that you actually can be or want to be Switzerland, that all referenda all the time is actually what we want to have. We should have a conversation about what is the kind of democratic engagement you're trying to foster. Uh, but that's often a hard conversation to have with people who have manned the barricades, protested in the streets, and fought hard just to get this uh, innovation and this reform uh, in place. However, there is an opportunity here, I think, to ask the question and to do experiments to, to ask how we can improve the way these things work. This is an important also uh, advance, I would say, and change from the way that we've thought about research in the citizen engagement space before. So typically, and there is a great wealth of research in the deliberation space that asks uh, one of two questions. What's the incentive for individuals to participate? And the second question that often gets asked is what is the discourse, what's the quality of the discourse that happens among people once they engage? So you have lots of uh, kind of conversation in the research literature in this column that I would call people about individuals and how they behave. 
What we tend to see a lot less of is then research on what is the impact on institutions, what's the impact on outcomes and quality of the products that they create, like laws or regulations, um, and how does that differ depending on who runs and operates these processes, who owns them, how they're organized. There is a big open gap in terms of looking at outcomes and, out and, and outputs and how that relates to the design of these systems. So I think that there's a big gap. There's a lot more done on that individual side and much less in terms of uh, what's the quality of information that we're getting and what's the effectiveness of these processes in terms of institutions and how they operate. So. Um, there is, uh, to quote, uh, I don't know what chapter that's in, I just figured I'd throw up some random quote from you, to say there is a great opportunity here that even though it's messy, even though we're in the field, even though we're in the real world, we don't have incredibly large sample sizes, we don't necessarily have randomness, I don't know, and you can, I think you won't disagree with me here that there is a great opportunity to do work in this space. Uh, and hearing more from you about what we can meaningfully uh, and can't do, I think is part of what this conversation is about. Okay, so for Madrid, and I should say everything I'm about to show you predates the election that happened in Madrid and the decision about the coalition that happened a week ago. I don't know how much you're following politics in Madrid, but it is one of the dangers of doing real work in the field, which is politics can put an end to your research. We, we don't know yet what the attitude of the new right-wing government will be towards the work that we're doing. We do know that everybody that we're working with is looking for a job right now. Um, so it will be a few weeks till some of this research gets restarted. Uh, but as I've said, since there are so many cities using this platform, we already have a commitment from Barcelona to kind of absorb the whole project and do it there uh, if we don't do it in Madrid. Um, okay, so the question is what kind of research could we do here? And I will just quickly go through some of this. Uh, this is the pr proposals thing that I already told you about, and I'm going to skip ahead here. Blah. Okay, so lots of ideas that we, and I'm by we, the list of people that I just breezed through, which included Matt's name on it, um, who did some informal advising on trying to make recommendations about the kinds of things that we could study if you have data from 460,000 people participating in such a platform. So we could test uh, um, a whole variety of things, including like whether we do a better job of targeting who participates, whether we prime the messages we use and using different kinds of primes, we will get different results in terms of participation. Um, we can test things like whether improving the quality of the proposals would get more people to sign them. We can test whether giving people points or rewards, intrinsic versus extrinsic rewards, again back to this incentives question, would change how people participate. We took as a given their goal of wanting to get more signatures. Now again, on a personal level, I don't think that trying to create all referenda all the time is a great thing to do. But we wanted to understand from a methods perspective, from a practical perspective, what would it mean to introduce research into this context and into this setting. So we brought up a number of different experiments. Um, so I'll just go through one or two of them uh, uh, to give you some idea here. So on this question of what would it mean to actually target, if there is a proposal, for example, about schools or education, what would it mean if we actually targeted teachers or people in school or people with relevant expertise on a topic uh, as we talk about, uh, to, to, when we talk about this issue? And we could do that by potentially segmenting the audience and showing proposals to people to sign, whether or not they have anything to do with the proposal, we can show it to people uh, who in fact have a particular qualification or skill. So if it's an education proposal, we show it to teachers. Um, and we can also, uh, having asked people what you're passionate about, what you care about, we can show it to people who may have no professional qualification, but may have an interest in the topic, and see whether that bears any uh, relevance on the question of whether people sign the proposal or not. You get the idea. I will fast forward. I'm happy to, in questions or discussion, talk about any of these specifically. Maybe I'll go, I'll, I'll flick the slides a little slower so you could read them. Um, we, after proposing many experiments, we were able to narrow down on four. 
And not surprisingly, though, the place that we got agreement to begin to test and to begin to make modifications to the software to allow us to do some testing um, was really around the question then. Um, whoops, let me go to the, uh, whoops, let's see what slide. Here it is. Um, is to address this quest two questions. Will increasing the quality of the proposals lead to more signatures? That was something that they were willing to test, that that would actually lead to more signatures, um, and that we thought was incredibly important to really understand whether there's a correlation between the uh, implementability of a proposal and the willingness of citizens to engage around it. Um, we had to then come up with a concept of what does high quality mean, how we were going to get to high quality proposals, and how we were going to test this, in this case by introducing a series of proposals that were really professionally drafted and well done according to a template of what constitutes a well-defined proposal. Uh, and then we would uh, have a control that was just or whatever citizens put up there, which was sometimes, frankly, just whatever crap people posted, and that we would see what actually happened. There's a second experiment that is, um, uh, that's ongoing, which is to ask this question of whether giving people an extrinsic reward, in this case in the form of points, that you could convert into other civic benefits and rewards, uh, would actually cause more people to sign. So again, more detail on this, and I'm happy to share the slides about how we've thought about some of this uh, and some of the challenges of doing it. Um, I, I should say, as a practical matter, these have started, but again, politics have now interrupted, so I'm waiting on a little report on kind of where we're at, literally, um, because everybody has, <laughs> there's basically, there is no government right now in Madrid, uh, and running the project uh, um, has its challenges. So note to self as researchers, electoral timelines and time horizons are very important to undertaking these kinds of projects and ensuring that they are um, insulated from the vagaries of politics. Okay. So I'm going to move forward now, unless there are particular questions or comments on anything I've said up until now. OK, good. Uh, what I want to do is to talk to you, and here's the part where I get to call on you, um, about some new work, new and related work, again, coming back to the US context and the US Congress. And here is where I want to talk about what I've already hopefully made the case with in showing some of the work in Madrid and in talking about uh, this topic, is the opportunity to do what is sometimes called research in pastor's quadrant, what's sometimes called action research. In other words, we have an opportunity to do some research here that both advances our fundamental understanding of political institutions, of democratic engagement, of democracy, of a variety of questions, while at the same time needing to solve a real problem for a real client. Um, so the problem I'm going to present to you, and in fact, one of those clients is on the live stream with us now. We're joined, I hope, by Aaron Huertas of the uh, United States House Special Committee, Select Committee on Climate Crisis. Aaron has put to us the question, and his colleagues, how might we use the opportunity of this select committee whose job it is to, that is, so it's a committee of members of the House of Representatives of the United States government that has as its charge, oops, I think I have a slide there, um, that has as its charge the creation of legislative recommendations for Congress around uh, combating climate change. Now, it's important to recognize as we talk about this, uh, and we can get into some of this in the Q&A, but as you think about the experiments and opportunities that we have, is that we do not have an unlimited amount of time. Aaron's committee is time delimited and must hand in its recommendations early next year, number one. Number two, we exist in a very partisan climate we cannot do things that are only for the left and not for the right. We can't do things or have a conversation only with people in cities and not in rural areas. So we have to think about the implications in terms of legitimacy of anything that we do or design. 
but we're here today to have a, an ex conversation about what kinds of experiments we could design that would allow Aaron and his committee and the, his team to, and the congressmen, that Congress people, persons that he works for, to reach out to the American people, or more broadly, especially to young people, what can they do to use new technology to engage with the collective intelligence of the public to develop better, more informed proposals for Congress? and at the same time create a first of its kind way for the American people to directly engage in the work of Congress, something that I think is long overdue when we're talking about making law in the 21st century. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to explain, it's easier to forget these broad questions, I think it'll be easier to talk about two possible experiments, and I think we should do one at a time, and I'm going to ask for Matt's help on discussing this one. The first proposal, or the first idea, and keep in mind we have to do something that works. I have to not get Aaron fired, job number one. Uh, number two actually achieves the goal of getting meaningful information to Congress. And three helps to advance our, uh, frankly we'll be happy with one and two, but we're here to have a conversation about how we also do three. What we can think about in terms of research. So the first proposal, the first draft of an idea, is that what we should do is use a tool that Matt and his students have developed that he'll tell you about to get people's input on what are the uh, most impactful solutions to, climate, to the climate crisis that people want to see Congress uh, legislating about. And let me, Matt, come down here. I'm going to hand you the mic, if you don't mind. Uh, let me say from the outset that one of the, another thing we have to think about practically is the answer, for those of you who are American, the answer cannot be enact the Green New Deal. The answer for those of you who are not from here cannot be fix climate change or lower warming, slow down warming from two degrees. We need specific answers, specific help that is actually actionable. So let me let Matt explain to you how this might work, and then we're, gonna, we're here to get your ideas and thinking from a practical perspective, from a research perspective, you from your, we want to hear your doubts, uh, and we'll go from there. Cool. We'll see if I have another image. Oops, there we go. And hello, Aaron, is his name? I, I assume it's Aaron. Hi, Aaron. Um, I hope we can help you. Um, so this is a tool that um, some colleagues and I have created, which you'll learn more about when we talk about surveys. But the idea is that we wanted to come up with a system that could simultaneously collect and prioritize ideas. So if you think of a survey, it's usually very good at measuring public opinion about things that you already know to ask about. And so if you've ever designed a survey for a setting, for example, I've designed surveys that would be deployed in other countries. And while I'm doing that, I'm always thinking, wow, there's a lot of stuff I don't know about where this survey is going to be deployed. Maybe I haven't asked the right question. Maybe I haven't chosen the right words to use. Um, and so as a social scientist, though, I know that we have these other techniques that are very good at eliciting information from people, like interviews and participant observations, where we can actually learn new things. But then those techniques are slow and expensive and hard to quantify and hard to scale up in these kind of large-scale citizen engagement projects. And so what this project does, the uh, wiki survey project, is it tries to come up with something that combines the quantifiability of a survey with the openness of an interview. This is from a project that we did with Mayor Bloomberg's office in New York, uh, where they were looking for ideas to make New York a greener and greater city. And so they seeded this wiki survey with about 25 ideas that they had collected from their prior public engagement. They sent out the link to all over the city. Uh, and then people would come to the website and they were shown these two options that were randomly chosen from the pool of ideas. Then someone could vote on one of these and then another pair would show up. And they would continue to vote in this way until they wanted to stop. Also at any time anyone could add a new idea which would go into the pool of ideas to be voted on by other people. 
And so this mechanism turns out to be a good way to collect a bunch of new ideas and prioritize them. And one of the things that we consistently see, so in this project with the mayor's office, in the end, eight of the top 10 ideas were uploaded by users. And we see very, very consistently that ideas that are uploaded by participants end up scoring higher than ideas that are created by the people in the institutions themselves. And we have a lot of ideas for why that's the case, reasons that that's the case. Um, but so this is a great way of collecting inputs. And I think one of the things that Beth talks about often in citizen engagement is thinking about whether you are searching for problems or whether you are searching for solutions. Um, so that would be one thing I think we could talk about here. And also, who do you want this input from? Uh, and then how also does this feed into another decision-making process? Because one of the challenges that you see in this simple idea it, it is, is there's nothing about cost or implementation complexity uh, or interdependence between ideas. So for example, if we were going to use something like this to design the healthcare law in the US, some people in the, so for those of you tuning in on the live stream, we have a very complicated healthcare system in the US. Um, and so I think many people in the US would like for everyone to have access to insurance independent of their any pre-existing conditions they have. And also many people in the US would not like to have a mandate that people buy health insurance. So these are both, but it is very difficult to have both of those things simultaneously. And so this system is very good for sort of eliciting ideas that people are excited about. But then often there has to be a second step where someone who understands the complexity of the problem, the difficulty of these different things, to take this as an input into a, a different decision-making process. So that's a little bit about all our ideas. Do you want to talk well, more wanna, about that? I think what I want to do is I want to I open it up to people online or in the room. The disadvantage of being in the room is I can call on you. So I encourage you to volunteer. Uh, with the question, and again, input or reactions, both in terms of, as a practical matter, what we should do to solve a problem for Aaron, what do you see as being the interesting research questions that we could study, and knowing, and just so Aaron doesn't have a heart attack if he's on the phone, we may not do the research the very first time we do this, maybe we'll do it the second time after we make sure it doesn't break and Aaron doesn't get fired. Um, but we want to start thinking about what kind of data this will generate, what we can gather, and then also thankfully because it's an open source tool and designed by Matt, how we can change it to study things in new ways and introduce some element of randomization that might allow us to do some interesting work. So any, uh, what, what's the instructions on the mic? What, who has the mic? Where's the mic? This is the mic? Okay. I, since, you're, I, since I can reach you. Just to clarify, this is about the issue of climate change, correct? Is that what we're, about okay, good. I just want to make sure. Change, okay. About the issue of climate change, although, uh, to be honest, we are going to use it in some other contexts too. But okay. For the sake of our discussion, we should stay focused, I think, on climate change. Okay. Um, as really interesting, I'm sure we have people in the room who are thinking about social media data on climate change, about protests, about there's lots of, this is a, and this is an issue in which we have a very So it's about climate change. Okay. <laughs> um, well, so I guess about this, about the issue itself um, and about the work that's been done on it, I think um, an interesting place to start, especially if you're trying to get a good gauge for public opinion, um, is not so much on the actual solutions, but it's, it's gauging, it may be gauging the public interest in the potential for, there's been st like work on this, there's a really good paper, I think it's titled Solution Aversion, and basically what they find within this is that Conservatives are not opposed basically to the issue of climate change, but rather the solutions. And namely, it's it, government intervention. And so if you're thinking of kind of starting from a, like, a, like 10,000 feet up, I think it may, be, it may be helpful, especially like within this, this sort of setting. I could almost imagine where you have, um, if this, this is sort of forced choice, you could, you could have a, a, a sort of experimental design where you're, you're initially asking about the the, the sort of the sort of problem versus the solution um, and then you you get a gauge on that initially you're kind of priming people f for thinking about it one way or another and then uh, yeah sort of subsequent questions 
So let me ask you or anybody else the question of as between, we have a choice here to Matt's point of asking people about what they think are the most important problems versus what they think are the most important solutions. Uh, are you, is your uh, response suggesting that asking about problems may be more effective than asking about solutions? I guess my response is that I don't know. I, I don't know how the public would react in the event of, of either of those questions. And so I think, yeah, testing that is probably pretty, would, would be a good place to start. Hi. I have a, uh, I'm like both very optimistic about this. Like I see this as a really powerful tool for gauging what people care about, what's, what's going to have traction. Yeah, I'm, I'm Jaron. I'm from Berkeley. I mean, you see Berkeley, sociology. And uh, so that's, that's kind of my gut reaction. At the same time, my, my head's saying uh, there's some kind of, I have some cynicism coming up. If you're proposing solutions to people, um, like who is this going to reach? Like. Uh, a, a, a digital intervention like this is going to reach people in cities with computers. That's uh, my, 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 my doubt. So um, are we going to learn anything that's actually new? And I, I, I think the answer is yes, but I, I just want to raise that as a how are we getting beyond, how are we working around political polarization um, with a tool like this? Was there an experiment in there to test it? Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, I actually want to hear Matt on this. <laughs> yeah, here. Okay. Yeah. Um, one of the things that's come up a couple times is the idea of polarization and different people wanting different things. Um, so one of the capabilities you would have, if the members of the, the committee will participate in this, they can share the different, they can share, we could create separate um, URLs for each member of the committee or for subsets of the committee, like let's say all the Republicans and all the Democrats. I wouldn't want to split people up that way, but for the purposes of discussion, we could do that. Then they, those people would share the link with their constituents who would maybe mainly share their views and then you could get a list of ideas from each of these communities separately and look for ideas that score high within both communities uh, we can yes so we can uh, Oh yeah, so the question is, can we geolocate the people through this tool? And the answer is sort of. Uh, the answer is we know people's IP address when they visit our site, and so we can geolocate to the IP address. Inside of the US, that's generally pretty accurate, um, certainly to the state, uh, not necessarily incredibly narrowly. Um, so I do think, but uh, then you still wouldn't know, let's say, if the person responding was someone who voted for a Republican or voted for a Democrat. So I think you would sort of, you could pretend, I think my guess is that these things don't spread totally virally because they're not as exciting as a lot of other things that are happening online. And so if you had a member of Congress spread the URL, I think it would be most likely to end up in a constituency close to that particular member. Um, and we have some new ideas. Hi, uh, I'm Tiago from the University of Maryland. And I think that's more like a general suggestion than like something more specific to this research. Uh, in Brazil, we had like literally more than 1,000 experience of participation like this. And there was like one experience that was like really interesting that was called the National Public Policy Conferences. And, and I think that can be like really inspiring to see what happened in Brazil and to think about like things that you can do for this particular research question. So in the National Public Policy Conference were basically like um, um, in most of the process were like in person participation, so not exactly online, but was a process that like the federal government used to publish like a initial report and then have meetings like in basically like all 
not all the municipalities, but like the largest number of the municipalities and states, and ask people to give suggestions about this initial text. And then in the end, there was like a huge conference, like in general, like 400, 500 of people that were elected since the municipal level uh, that could vote like for the final document. And there was like some research in Brazil showing that the Congress used to adopt some of these proposals from the public. So I know that we're discussing like more like online participation, but there was some experience of like in-person participation was quite effective and can, can inspire like the initiatives that you're thinking here. Hello, uh, Nanette Coleman from Berkeley Sociology. Uh, I think one of the, the challenges with an issue like climate change is the amorphous nature of it. So I, I think about my own research with regards to privacy. And when I describe this idea of privacy violation or breach to individuals, their reaction is very different based on whether the framing has to do with their own activity in themselves, um, very often versus uh, an older parent or a child. The, the reaction is quite different. So I think uh, before you get to the idea, this is building on Andrew's point, of either solution or, or, or thinking about the problem, you have to properly frame the problem. So a forced choice uh, with, with Republicans, Democrats, building on what Matt said, sending uh, different uh, people of uh, elected officials, sending it to people that, that sort of share their inclinations, uh, but doing so in a way that forces their choice with different framings so we can make sure that we're presenting in a way that, that uh, dilutes the, the, the amorphous nature of, of, I think, the issue generally. So I have uh, one suggestion here and what appear to be two questions, so uh, bear this in mind. Uh, Maddie from our Istanbul location uh, says, so what might be cool and actively studied in com human computer interaction studies is creating more material interfaces with civic engagement systems. It would make the participation more like a performance and would allow people to engage with the topic highly differently compared to online only systems. Um, Jeff from our Boston location asks, where is the space for organizing these individuals beyond surveying public opinion to bring weight and power behind these proposals? Why this digitized approach beyond approaches like participatory, pr participatory planning in places like Porto Alegre, Brazil, or Kerala, India? I suppose I worry about the participation being made shallower than it is being made out to be. Um, I don't know if you want to respond to that question first before the second question. OK. And then David, I believe, uh, uh, also in the Boston location, is there a concern that people are likely to think about decisions affecting individual behavior and miss systemic incentives? We have work showing that uh, proposing a nudge to promote enrollment in green energy plants reduces support for a carbon tax, and he provides a couple of links. Um, yeah, so if you want to respond. Ooh, those were, uh, Matt, you may have better answers than I do, so I'm going to uh, share the mic with you on this one. Uh, so let me say, on, so on to the first point about sort of learnings from human-computer interaction and the performative aspect uh, and, frankly, learning that we've had from political science around deliberation and the ritual of deliberation, I'm going to talk in a second about a, about a real-time, another modality of engagement and ask you again what you think in just a minute. Um, so I very much like that point. To the second two questions coming from Boston, uh, the one about uh, disincentives for disincentives for support for policymaking options, I think. Uh, I mean, I, I think the question is how does and really for both questions is how does this idea of citizens engaging with this impact that. In other words, to the first point or question about who's organizing the engagement and participation, I think there's both some consideration there about in order to engage with people, we would have to use interest groups as amplifiers. Uh, we would have to go to the places where people are already engaged around these issues. And we have to think about what the implications of that uh, are. I think to the, the, the second issue, though, is we have so little way to engage today in terms of sharing our know-how with Congress in any fashion at all, participating in these processes in any way, shape, or form, that I'm really hard-pressed to see how 
Um, well, I'm about to say this, and I'm going to take it back. I was about to say it couldn't get worse, but it could get worse. <laughs> could get much worse. Uh, so I want to be careful in what I say, and there are a lot of ways to do this wrong uh, that I think could get us into quite a bit of trouble. Um, but that wrong that I'm more worried about, more than the question you ask, is designing a process that either leads to too much information that policymakers can't use, or the wrong kinds of information that people can't use, or the third, which is a lack of uh, relevance or feedback. In other words, we do all of this, and it becomes what some people call democracy theater. We do it, and they become even more turned off and less trusting of Congress than they are already. Considering rates of trust of Congress are at 4%, it's pretty hard to get lower. Um, so it's, it's, it would be hard, very much hard to get worse. But the question of whether I think I'm, I'm still, the part about sort of how it might create individual disincentives, like if I participate in this, am I going to take longer showers? Um, am I going to recycle less? Uh, will I go out and eat a burger because I used Matt's tool? Uh, sorry if I'm, I'm uh, uh, making jokes. Um, I'm, I'm, I think, you know, any of these things, it's a real question, and I think that of, of things we could test and look at is does engagement here actually, would that lead people to be more likely to vote or less likely to vote? Uh, I will just say on this score that there are two researchers, uh, if you're in computational social science, you probably know the name David Laser up at Northeastern, somebody maybe a student of his, in fact, here, maybe they're on the line. Uh, hi, David, if you're online. Um, so David has done some wonderful work together with a co political science colleague and statistician at University of at Ohio State uh, named Michael Neblo on studying political behavior associated with citizens participating in town telephone and online town halls with members of Congress. And what they found was that people who participated in a town hall with their member of Congress were more likely to go out and vote. Uh, were more likely to be politically engaged, and there was a really higher correlation in terms of actually positive effects from participation rather than negative ones. But I do appreciate the point about uh, tra trade-offs in this space. Do you want to add anything? Sure. I just like, would like to say a couple things. So one is I completely agree with all of the uh, questions about framing. Uh, and what I would try to do is try to turn that in from a bug into a feature. And so one of the biggest differences that I see often between the way social scientists approach a problem and data scientists is data scientists often try to frame a problem as a maximization problem instead of trying to frame it as an understanding the mechanism problem, which social scientists do. So often we think, how do we understand this? And what if we switched just for a second and said, how do we find a, a piece of text that as many people as possible from as many different backgrounds will support. Um, and that's like not the way a social scientist normally asks their question, but if you express it as a maximization problem, then you can imagine saying, all right, well, let's, when people hit this website, we're gonna randomize them to a different question text. We're gonna have all these different uh, ways of recruiting different pools of people. And so that leads to this, some of the questions about in-person activity. So there was a, the uh, governor in Brazil, a lot of this open government work seems to be happening in Brazil. So in Rio Grande do Sul, uh, Tarsen Genro used um, all our ideas. And one of the things that I loved about the way that they did it is they put it on iPads and they just went out into town and like stuck their iPads in people's faces in a very polite way, I'm sure, and said, hey, we're doing this, we want, um, we want to get your feedback. So in addition to trying to recruit people through, oh, there we go, no, 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 that's good. So in addition to trying to recruit people through Twitter and these other online mechanisms where we were talking about the problem that your recruitment mechanism might bleed into other groups, you could also imagine um, getting a bunch of iPads, bringing them into a place where you have a bunch of people who you know what they're, uh, you have some sense of what community or constituency they come from and doing it in person that way. Um, so then to, so, to try to close this, so if we think of it as a maximization problem and we mix in this kind of in-person recruitment, we can imagine trying to s do it, this with many different communities very quickly and trying to find um, pieces of text that are attractive to all of them. 
So with your permission, I'm going to move ahead and show you one more idea and see what feedback people have and then any comments or questions on this or anything else. So to Matt's point about not having this be a standalone precisely because the uh, resulting information that we will get will answer certain questions in terms of prioritization, but not in terms of implementation. Uh, and because if we do something like this, it will invariably rely on self-selection by participants, which will lead to a lot of the biases and concerns that we've heard about urban participation. I mean, the environmental movement in this country, uh, you know, is, is focused in certain key places. It's largely female. It's a certain age group. There's, I mean, at least among the new generation of environmental activists, uh, so we would have a lot of challenges because this would involve self-selection. We have to ask the question about whether we should think about what political scientists would call a sortition mechanism. So whether we think about using an online mechanism to create an online town hall uh, of participants to have uh, deliberative conversations about climate change. And the proposal here is to actually try to attract people under the age of, let's call it 21, but a youth audience, and to create a, ra uh, what I might call, uh, and forgive me, this is not the, this is not technically quite accurate, but I'm gonna say the um, uh, random but not representative sample of participants by reaching out to mayors across the country and asking them to select 10 young people in their city to participate in this online town hall so that we would get some geographic representation, albeit we would have, I think, a very difficult time of creating a truly representative sample of the under 18 crowd. Um, some, and I think that's worth discussing is number one, what could we do to uh, ensure greater legitimacy in the process by in some way getting a more representative sample of participants, how we would do that with youth, and then again how we would construct the process. The thought about the mechanics is that like the online town halls that have been run by Lazar and Neblo, is that we would first have a large group conversation in which the politicians would explain what the committee does and explain what their charge is and talk about the boundaries and the issues and then break people down into random smaller groups to have more meaningful discussions around selected issues with a moderator to elicit what their views are on which are the most important uh, issues. And again, there, there's a lot of learnings from the offline deliberation space, uh, from places like Brazil, from experiments done around deliberative polls around the world, uh, from uh, uh, um, uh, citizen assemblies that are going on now in France and have been done for many years in Canada and elsewhere. We have some learnings about how to construct those live deliberative conversations. But I think thinking about just the frame, I'll give you only these basics, that we would do something to create a sortition practice or process using a youth audience and then to engage people in a live discussion. I want to come back to the question of what your reactions are in terms of how we would design it and what we could study that would, again, both solve a problem while advancing some of our understanding about how, how we could actually study these things in the field. Is that enough to go on? You want to add any more framing to that? I would say um, thinking about this as a research opportunity, um, a couple things about, the, well, actually, I'm not going to say what. There was a couple of things she said that sounded, yeah, you all go first. Um, but I think the, in the last project, I think we talked a lot about um, how to make it effective for the government, which we definitely want to do. Um, in this one, I see also a lot of opportunities for research. So I want to try to do both. I want to try to be in Pastor's Quadrant. Like, that's the place that we want to be. Um, so let's see if we can get there. Uh, Nienk Niesink, uh, Carnegie Mellon University Statistics and Data Science Department. Um, so I think this is a really great idea. 
not only for as a research opportunity, but also as uh, like an outreach opportunity, but and an, an opportunity to raise awareness or among a group that m is maybe not already aware of uh, a potential the p potential problem of climate change, and. Um, Instead of, or maybe apart from doing this uh, random sampling, uh, going to the mayors, I thought, so I, I'm originally from the Netherlands, and we, al we often have these programs, for example, that you can design for teachers, where you just divine, uh, design a lesson program for an afternoon, um, in which you could implement exactly this, but maybe on a local scale, um, and then have a community, uh, like a national community, that w in which st students could participate, like with students at, at different schools. Um, okay, so this is not, I, I'm, I think it's a great idea, this is not, not the, the, research <laughs> the, research <laughs> the research view, but it's, but it bec because in this, in this way you can engage a lot of people, um, you don't really have a representative sample, but you may have, m it may become like a thing that other schools think, oh, we should participate in this as well, and it bec will bec um, yeah, become larger and larger. I, okay. I <laughs> um, so, my name is Malka Guillot. Uh, I'm from ETH Zurich, but I actually come from France. And I wanted to come back on what you say about what happened in France. So, what, what happened in France is that just after some political crisis, the government implemented some kind of online surveys, but it was also happening at the city level, like uh, every group could basically organize its own discussion, and then everything that was said was put online in a structured framework. But that being said, um, it had some uh, major drawbacks, which is the fact that, I mean, it was not la like ma Matt's design, because the answers w were proposed by the government and they were really politically oriented. And so it was not possible, like in individual citizens could not propose their own, I mean they could in some, in some comments propose their own ideas, but then it was not possible to contribute to the questions and just to see new ideas emerge. So um, I, think, I think that the merging these two ideas could be, could be really great and, and the um, higher, the, I mean, the larger the scale, the, the better. Quick, uh, quick, uh, so, so the comment is very, very much appreciated. Just for clarification, so the recent French, you will know better than I do, the recent reaction to the Yellow Vest protests was to create this very heavily engineered citizen engagement exercise. I think the one advantage of it, the one plus, was that they demonstrated you could actually organize citizen engagement in an efficient time frame. It was totally engineered and they, st and they said these are the questions and you can't change the questions. But they did it in like, they did it like in three months. So th the fact that they did it in three months, that was the, I think that was the real thing. Uh, I mean that was the good part. Uh, there's, of course, a National Center for uh, Citizen Engagement, which is, works on this topic, which they completely excluded and didn't involve at all. Um, but the other thing is now they are starting a sortition-based process around climate as a different process that is using this kind of citizen assembly technique. And it's worth noting that whether you like it or not, everybody wants to do one of these. The Scottish are doing this, the Irish are doing this, the French are doing this. Everybody sees a hammer and wants to like nail it with a citizen assembly right now, uh, even though it's not so clear how effective these things are. So just uh, some reaction to that. Please, let's put it back and then we'll get to that. Um, I'm Victoria Asbury. I am a sociology PhD student from Harvard. Um, I don't necessarily have a solution, but I think that you know, raising questions and concerns is also important. And one of my concerns with um, having mayors, for instance, um, pick who would be a part of these conversations is that mayors, like who is the friend of the mayor? Who knows the mayor? What students would, you know, the mayor tap into? And I think what's gonna be really important if we really wanna get people, um, more than just the people who are um, articulate, 
who understand these issues involved is that we're going to have to be willing to have people who are not telegenic, right? Who do not have the words, but who are thinking and who are part of the political process nonetheless. Um, so, um, um, Beth wanted to know um, what are some of the solutions for reaching um, more everyday youth, <laughs> if you will. Um, I don't know what the solution is, but I know what will be important, and it's going to be the courage to not be so concerned with how these people are reflecting on you. I think that is what will cause people to say like, I want the kid from AP Calculus or AP Bio to be on the screen instead of the kid who's like in regular, you know, bio and has a C, but who is clearly important for this conversation. And so just recognizing that even those who um, are not you know, the prettiest representatives um, are important to uh, this conversation. I just look at my t-shirt. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jay. I'm from UC Berkeley. I'm PhD student in political science. So I like your question about um, selection mechanism. So like you said, it's kind of random, but also not representative because you are randomly selecting mayors, but also those mayors uh, have some intention and some strategies, uh, the reasons to decide who is going to be representing uh, their, their cities. So one way you can think about that is like, uh, asking mayors to think about some kind of descriptive representation about um, their cities. So like if I ask a, a mayor of Oakland in California, and then if they may only chose 10 white students representing Oakland, it's kind of weird. And given the, the diverse population in Oakland, there should be some Latino students, there should be some black students, there should be some Asian students representing diverse boys in the community. And the second thing is about the design. So I think what I'm, it, there's kind of three steps happening here. One is um, selecting cities and then selecting the representatives, and then they are going to be assigned into different groups so that they are doing, having a small group discussion about the issue of the day. And for the third step, what I'm thinking is, maybe you can do some kind of pre-survey, asking their you know, attitudes and preferences, and you can use that variable uh, and then do some kind of block uh, randomization. And the reason is if you think about some theoretical literature about you know, deliberation, whether that's offline or online, we consider whether people having diverse opinions or they are kind of homogeneous is important. So like going back to Chris's work, you know, whether they're exposed to opposing views or not, that's also a critical factor in terms of the, um, how deliberation can evolve. So if you've got information about you know, those student representatives and then we can assign them into different groups. So maybe one group is like very homogeneous but on the left side, but one group is how much on the, on the right side, one group is kind of heterogeneous. So we can see that how deliberation happens in different ways. So maybe they're just confirming their bias or they can, uh, you know, finding a new solution. So one is like whether they are narrowing or diverging in terms of their, given their pre uh, uh, prior attitudes. And the other um, dependent variable you might be interested in looking at is political knowledge. So they're actually learning something from each other. I mean, so they are, they change, maybe they're changing their preference in A2s just to, based on experience, or maybe they're nearly learning something, something about their pol the policy, something about the you know, deliberation process. Because in the, in the end, what you want to happen here is not only like they are uh, changing their attitudes, but they are actually gaining some knowledge about governance, about, about democracy in the process. Because, that's a, because we, want, we want to empower citizens using this new platform. Would you like to take two or three more comments, Tiago, and then Lynette? Okay. Do you want to Tiago, do you want to 
yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a it's a quick suggestion. Like one of the things that used to work, and I think used to work well in Brazil for this kind of experience was instead of giving like directly to the mayor the responsibility to organize like the meetings, uh, actually enforce the the mayor to build like a larger body of responsibles to organize the the like the online meetings or the online town 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 hall. So in some experience like we used to like the government used to ask the mayor to build like a local council with thirty percent of representatives from civil society and more thirty percent of representatives for some other important group in the city. And this used to work in terms of like mobilizing more people, but also uh in terms of like opening space for different way of thinking and heterogeneous preference and everything and other groups be included. So I think that this used to work well and might be an experience here. And also something that can be randomized. So you can ask like for some mayors to organize this larger councils and other mayors to be like the only the solely responsible for expanding the process and you can measure later uh, what worked better. So I just want to go back and amplify Victoria's earlier comment about making sure we're getting different voices. So with the Oakland example, it's possible to have 10 black students who are all AP Bio students. I think we're not, we have to make sure that this is put in spaces where people who are unlikely to have the chance to speak will get a chance to speak. So an e example I might think about is having a photo booth um, with uh, the ability, in order, in order to be able to uh, take your picture, you have to vote on some sort of statement that's in front of you and maybe say something about the issue uh, in order to, to take the picture and maybe then you're allowed to post that if you'd like uh, re related to the topic. But I, I think that photo booth would have to be in a, in a park where there's a basketball court or at a concert somewhere where we remove uh, some of the structural inequality uh, that leads to certain voices having the ability to comment on these things and others not. Uh, Nick Camp, uh, Psychology, Stanford. Um, yeah, so I just want to agree with um, both of those statements about increasing um, not only the inclusion but also the footprint of the program because if it's very top down in terms of who gets to participate, it's not only limited in the um, options that get presented but also who's aware of the program and from what we know about the psychology procedural justice, whose uh, voices get heard. Um, so I agree that one option could be to try to field a large number of like anonymous opinions or um, just as wide a pool as possible. Uh, another approach could be to have students try to nominate their peers, um, which would also not only have the advantage of uh, getting influential people within their peer, peer group to participate, um, but also just increase the number of people who are even aware of the program and the possible benefits. Okay, so we have a few. Uh, Mateo from our RTI location states, uh, I think the idea is interesting and can, uh, of these town halls is interesting and can lead to some good research questions. However, why is the focus on young individuals? Why not broaden the audience? In terms of representation, why should younger individuals have a larger chance to influence policy? Is it a response to time avail availability? Um, should I, yeah, should I just keep going? Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Nick, uh, uh, location undisclosed. Uh, why not have students in schools do exercises among themselves and nominate peers? I think this process would a increase democratic participation, b increase the footprint of program of the program so more students are aware of the exercise, c produce higher quality proposals, and d uh, ensure that influential peers are included in the process. Uh, and uh, Nick has provided to a link uh, about to a uh, information about a program about combating bullying that he has in mind about this. Um, and I'll send you all the questions and text from this. Um, Maddie in Istanbul uh, says, so what I'm, uh, what I'm to be honest thinking with a huge online system is the results from deliberation do decrease a lot if the modality decreases, e.g. from video to audio or, uh, only to audio. Uh, he's, uh, he says he's not aware of a good comparison on face-to-face -face versus digital. Considering the importance of the topic, this is an interesting balancing act. That said, online platforms do provide opportunities for various, even small-scale experiments on the role of moderation, role of modalities, 
and different framings and information sources. And they are much cheaper than organizing a face-to-face -face panel. Um, and then uh, uh, and then David uh, from Boston again says, uh, this is more, uh, more a comment rather than a question. Uh, incentives for governments are probably not to generate effective ideas, but to avoid the kinds of protests that happen in France. Um, and then Maddie has uh, yet another comment if there's time, but I'll leave that to your discretion. Okay, just, yeah, and just bear in mind that uh, the live streamers can't hear without this microphone, so. Oh, this is Jaren, yeah, from Berkeley. Uh, Nick actually kind of beat me to the punch, but I want to just broaden that a little bit. Um, I think we can leverage some of the social structure that's sort of at the meso level, so we're talking about cities as the unit of sampling, for instance, but... Um, within cities, you've got churches, you've got schools, you've got all kinds of other civic organizations, and yes, bowling alone, et cetera, it's all, it's all very different these days. But um, often, I think digital networks reflect and then reinforce other networks. So um, ask the churches to, to select people, ask the schools and school districts to talk to their students and their teachers and select people. Um, that's a way of kind of broadening it. And also, you can structure those invitations to account for structural inequalities, inviting the schools to have no more than half of their selection be student leaders already, for instance, get, get some new players. Thought. I, I just wanted to raise maybe, oh, okay, I, I, I'm Amin, I'm a postdoc at uh, MIT Institute for Data Systems and Society. And uh, just um, one uh, maybe uh, more practical concern for such a thing to lead to an uh, actionable or a usable policy, there is a, we need so, some way of uh, increasing the probability that people actually reach a consensus after this deliberation. Otherwise, so we can produce, uh, we can investigate a lot of research questions, but then if uh, any of the, if many of the research conditions don't lead to a consensus, we may be actually in, in trouble in actually using the result of this experiment. So. There may be uh, existing ideas, for example, people may um, have difficulty reaching a consensus in a large group, but if uh, before actually deliberating in a larger group, they have uh, discussions in a s uh, smaller groups, uh, not necessarily everybody with each other, but uh, some subsets with each other, before actually engaging the deliberation in the larger group, that may increase the probability of reaching a consensus and making the results usable. Hi. I'm. Steph, uh, I'm actually in epidemiology at Penn, and um, this kind of pulls back from our conversation a little bit. But I, I do, I am, in, I am interested in posing this question to the group and to you. If the ultimate project here is to make governments more responsive to citizens, um, how do we think about before we kind of? Um, run away with this, the premise of this project, how do we think about measuring its ultimate impact on like, the decisions of, of policymakers, of, of elected officials? Um, Uh, hi, I'm uh, Monica. I'm teaching in the law school uh, in Maastricht University in the Netherlands. Um, and I have a slightly different comment slash question. So it has been mentioned already with, uh, with the project before that uh, there is a huge gap between a solution and the implementation, right? So the regulation itself that will be implementing this solution uh, will look completely different than the solution itself, right? And here with this project, it was also mentioned that to these citizen juries, it will be explained what the commission is doing, what is the proposal about, uh, for them to understand what's the what's the idea, and I was wondering whether that would be a good also area for research and you know trying out different solution in how to explain this whole you know legalese and like legal concepts in the regulations to uh, to citizens and also how to translate the ideas into the the uh, the regulations right, um, so that's. Hi, my name is Xiao Wen uh, from Princeton Physics. So just from uh, Princeton Physics, so just from an optim optimization point of view, 
What I was thinking about is the idea of having an online platform is a way of um, you know, kind of selecting more random response and maybe it's easier to reach a global minimum. But on the other hand, if you are pulling from, uh, you know, having this town hall or having people whose voice um, are kind of coming from a shared experience, then it's, uh, it feels like, um, you know, people are going to influence each other uh, more easily and then maybe you will reach some sort of solution um, for those individuals. Um, it's an effective way of finding different solutions, but just an idea of combining uh, the benefits of both. I was thinking about maybe you can have many smaller um, you know, meetings between individuals and then kind of brings their idea to each other, you know, to different groups. So that's kind of one way of, so say you have a, um, you know, the Democratic group and a Republican group uh, each reach some solution and then kind of just bring their idea to each other and maybe that's, uh, that could be an efficient way of reaching, you know, some op optimum. Yeah, no, I, I, um, it's interesting because even my question isn't, so people participate in different, I'm, I'm William, I'm from Colombia and a social worker. Um, so specifically, I think that there are different ways that people engage and it seems like most of the conversation in the room has been surrounding like crowdsourcing voice and how do you get people involved in a conversation. Um, I've been really um, trying to understand how do we crowdsource listeners and, and engaging in listening and some people actually having to do more listening than voicing um, and, and what does that look like and what are the practices behind that beyond let's tap the most influential people or let's involve more people in conversations but how do we actually create crowds for these conversations to happen um, and have and have large groups of people actually practicing this active listening so we can stop talking across people. I was just gonna just make a pitch for this as a research setting. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah, you go. I'll let you. I want you to have the last word. Okay. Um, so I think we talked about as a research setting, like some of the things that seem really exciting about this are many different groups with lots of opportunities for randomization. So you can imagine doing, we heard about pre-surveys, about attitudes and knowledge, then we can imagine randomizing how the groups are formed, the size of the groups, the information that they're given at the beginning, um, then at the end we can do a second survey and measure change. So there's a lot of opportunities there. A challenge seems to be how we measure what's actually happening in the group, because it's a very amorphous interaction, uh, and how we take the output of this group and present it to a policymaker. So the other thing we didn't see about all, with all our ideas is there's a, there's a link where you click view results and it shows you the top 10 results with a score. And so that is a very easy thing to show to a policymaker and that process of aggregating the opinions of the people is very transparent how it works. Here, imagine watching a bunch of these videos and then distilling that somehow would be difficult. So one idea I have which sort of built on one of the suggestions here would be, actually two of the suggestions would be having the people in the group decide which person from that group goes on to the next stage, kind of like March Madness. And then that's kind of like a filtering mechanism that uh, dip, lots of people can participate, but then you end up with something that a smaller number of people can sort of advocate for the people in their group. Um, so I think it's a great research setting. I think um, there's a lot of exciting possibilities. And I'm really curious to hear what you think about all of the suggestions we've provided.
<laughs> in, three, in three minutes and then to wrap up the talk. So I will do a very poor job, I apologize, of responding to the many good ideas that have been articulated. A few things um, that, mainly what I remember now after the many comments, uh, to the point about studying political learning and change in political attitudes and awareness, I think we have a lot of great basis in some of the work around things like deliberative polling that have studied exactly that, um, that I think is spot on here that could be very useful as a sort of uh, way of thinking about research. Um, the question about why younger individuals, hmm. Well, I will say what I wanted to say is that if one cares about older individuals who typically uh, you can tell us have more political influence and more political voice. Um, AARP, you may not know, has a panel of something like 35,000 randomly sampled individuals that they've constructed for themselves so they don't have to keep renting uh, and paying for random sampling. So there's great opportunities to do stuff with older people, but as your colleagues will tell you, they tend to have more political voice in our system. Uh, and so particularly around youth and climate, this is an area in which young people have become very engaged and I think there's a hunger to know what this generation that will experience the effects of climate change uh, uh, think and to create opportunities for them to have more voice. Um, lots of great comments about inclusion. Uh, one of the things I d intentionally didn't say because we have thought more about the details and mechanics that I've given you, uh, initially, so as to have a more interesting conversation, is to combine selection and self-selection. So one thing we can do, and I think some people alluded to this, is let people volunteer and reach out to a lot of different sources to let people know, hey, there's this opportunity, volunteer, and then from that we can sample. Um, and that might give us more than just geographic representation, but we could combine uh, a selection process with a self-selection process. I think we have the opportunity to do a number of things there. There's been a lot of suggestions online and off about peer nomination. Uh, I think we could have some debate about what kinds of voices that would give preference to over others, but you see there's a lot of, this touches on all these questions about who we're asking, whom we're asking, how we're selecting people, who's invited, and I think important is to think about is, is really from a research perspective but also from a political economy perspective to say this can't be a one-off. We're not trying to design one, you know, this is not one ring to rule them all. Um, the idea is we have to do a oh, one geeky person who laughed, thank you. Um, the idea is we have to do lots and lots and lots of experiments. Um, we don't have to do them all with the Climate Crisis Committee in Congress. We have so many of these things going on around the world that if we think about them, number one, how do we share data and standardize some of the data sharing across these experiments? How do we catalog some of these experiments? How do we begin to create a more systematic research agenda around them? I think there's a lot of things we can do to study different questions. To your point about whether the ultimate goal is responsiveness to citizens, I think that's one choice of things we can study. Frankly, my interest here is to make the case that democratic participation and engagement, which has been a long cherished ideal, cherished ideal of participatory democracy, we don't have a lot of empirical proof that that actually leads to better decision making. It's we kind of hold it as self-evident that we should have citizen engagement because it's the right thing to do. But in fact, especially in this day and age, you have lots of people pointing to authoritarian countries and saying, look, it's more efficient there, it works better there. So I think there's an urgent need to show that engagement actually leads to better outcomes. I'm particularly drawn to this set of questions because I've done a lot of work previously in the space of transparency and open data, and I can tell you that I've had a thousand arguments till I'm blue in the face about why being transparent is the right thing to do. Until you can prove to people that being transparent and opening up data helps to create jobs and generate economic value, politicians are not very interested. So I think there's a very urgent tactical agenda here about doing research that demonstrates the effectiveness, but responsiveness is also a very, very important question. Um, the question about consensus, 
and whether and how we lead to consensus, the question about whether we take information from one deliberation, use that to feed into another, the mechanics of that are things I don't think I have time to get into the details of, but just two responses here. One is I think it's a question and a choice about whether the goal is to get to consensus that depends on what our goal is, or is the goal to surface new and ideas that have not been heard before. If the goal is to get at new and interesting and creative ideas that people have not heard from the usual suspects, then consensus is not something that we actually have to aim for. But it gets back to, and I may sort of uh, uh, start to wrap up on this point, it gets to the broader point, which is that ultimately this is about what kind of democracy we want to have and what is the role in research in helping us to investigate the answer to that question. I deliberately chose only two things to show you today. I think it was, we had quite a robust discussion. But we've also talked with this committee about using another tool called Your Priorities, which has been used by a million and a half people in places all around the world that actually lets people, instead of having an open-ended discussion, it lets people make proposals. What language is that in? Well, something, Spanish, I don't know. Uh, it's been used all over the world, but it's primarily from Iceland, is the creator of this. It's another open source tool, again, a nonprofit thing. Again, something we're actually in the process of modifying to test out how some different features work. Uh, but I wanted to just show you this interface because it hits on some of the points that people made. To your wonderful point about listening, their design, they feel, is about creating that opportunity to listen in, to listen by having people have a conversation around one another's ideas whether it works or not is another matter but it's a very but it's an interesting question um, finally and I will end with this example oops bad slide sorry um, in Taiwan where's our Taiwan here you are uh, ever been on B Taiwan no 200,000 people who have less to do than you uh, I think um, well, you're busy. You're not. Uh, you're not in Taiwan now. You're. You're here, so you don't have time. But 200,000 people in Taiwan are part of a process that is both online and offline. To Maddie's points and our Boston points about sort of the performative aspects, it has both aspects. And those people are working to design legislation together. The result of this process has led to 26 pieces of legislation that have been enacted in the last two years of the existence of this program. So if we talk about sort of pure like outcomes and what works, this has been one of the most successful experiments from the perspective of changing institutional practice. Uh, and so there's some discussion about what have they done there and how might we replicate this here taking some of those lessons and what you've said, which is the need for online and offline, the need for reaching out to diverse voices to include people, the need to listen to people by having conversations in real space and online, but ultimately to think about how do we connect this to real power, to the way that money is spent, to the way that decisions are made, and the way that power is wielded. And I would just close by encouraging all of you to live in Pasteur's Quadrant and to spend your time thinking about how we can address the issues of inequality uh, that face us today, and we can use our research to make people's lives better and to deepen democracy. And with that, I will stop. Thank you. Oh, and just to say, if anybody's interested in continuing the conversation about these experiments, uh, I am reachable at, if you can spell my last name, Novek. Novak at anything will get to me. Novak at NYU, Novak at the GovLab, Novak at Gmail. If you can spell it, you will find me. So that's the threshold. If you can't spell it, then, uh, then you flunk the test. But otherwise, I would love to hear from you with your ideas, uh, with your interest in participating. These are very real projects, and they're unfolding now. And we desperately need help. And yes, we do have some funding. So Beth, on behalf of everyone here and everyone on the live stream, we want to thank you again for coming.